<laughs> well, hello, everybody. It is Dennis and Andy, and this is another movie review and a few. We went and saw Oppenheimer. I don't know why I say it like that, but Oppenheimer last night, um, three hours long. First thing I want to say is, Dennis, my God, I feel like a proud father. This man did not get up once to use the bathroom in a three hour movie. And considering the time we sat down to the time we left, almost three and a half. I was, I mean, like an hour in, I'm like, any minute now he's going to get up. I'm like <laughs> playing this game of, does this look like a scene Dennis would get up to use the bathroom in? And it never came to fruition. Yup. You know, it, it was indeed a three hour and zero minute movie. And it did not feel it. I was so engaged with the movie that even when I had to go to the bathroom, I wasn't going to get up and, and go. Um, it, it would have taken me being dragged by a pack of wild horses to, to get me to leave that theater. And the interesting thing was I didn't notice anybody else really getting up and leaving the movie theater either, which was yeah, a good sign. That's a very good point. So Oppenheimer, of, of course, is about uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer, the, the main man behind the Manhattan Project that invented the bomb. And um, this movie was a lot more than what I thought it was going to be going in because the trailers going into this movie really just gave you the sense that it was going to be almost uh, the movie starts, World War II is going down, all right, let's introduce uh, Killian Murphy as Oppenheimer. Great, let's get him in uh, into that city they built out in the desert and just there. But it was so much more than that. Yeah, so we, we do, it does start off and it, it's, it's cool because it at least takes you through the things that you thought you were going to get. Um, Lieutenant General Leslie Groves, who wasn't a general at the beginning, appoint right. um, Oppenheimer to work. And of course, Groves is played by Matt Damon, who was fantastic in the role. Oppenheimer is played by Killian. And you know what? I think Killian Murphy is going to be up for an Oscar for this nomination. Yep. Um, you know, I hate talking Oscar talks. I'm not a huge fan of the Oscars because this would be a travesty if he did not get the nod for this. He was that good. Robert Downey Jr., because th this is the second storyline, there, there's two that kind of intersect, and it's a Christopher Nolan movie. So with Christopher Nolan, you are always got jumping in time, or he's always playing with time. This movie was no exception. And the other trope that Christopher Nolan has is a lot of times the audible has problems. The audio or the verbiage that people are saying, it's difficult to make out. There was a little bit of that at the beginning, and I'm like, oh, crap, here it goes again. But I actually didn't think it was bad. Now, we did not see it in IMAX. It was digital, um, but that's all we got to see it in. And I had no problems other than a very occasional um, dialogue, being able to make out the dialogue in this. So for me, it was a step up. I didn't hit the trope. But, uh, you know, typical Christopher Nolan. And um, Robert Downey Jr. played Levi Strauss, which was the secondary one. I had no idea this movie was going to favor him so heavily in this. And it is such a great behind the scenes working as he weaved it. And Robert Downey Jr., again, Academy Award for, I, I think he's not the main one, but, you know, he is your... Um, well, he would have to be... Well, I don't know, because... He wasn't, honestly, I could see lead actor Academy Award nods for both of them, Killian and Robert Downey Jr., because Robert Downey Jr. was not a supporting actor. Um, nope, but I think in this movie, he really, he would be considered the supporting actor in this movie, mm, but he, he was very prominent in it. I mean, it's about Oppenheimer, but I can see these two guys being both nominated and winning. Well, the thing, too, is in the trailer, you never really saw Robert Downey Jr. at all. So I was led to believe that he was this, this incidental character that you just 
was just in the background. But no, he it was definitely, you know, if you want to put this in uh, in uh, in uh, words of hero villain, you know, Oppenheimer was the hero, and you know, Strauss was the villain in this. And like you said, it does play with the time. You also had Emily Blunt who played uh, Oppenheimer's wife. Jack Quaid was in it. We know him from The Boys and other things. I mean, this movie, every time a pivotal character came on the screen, about an hour and a half in, if that, you were like, oh, who's it going to be? Because heads were just popping of actors. And you're like, what? What? This guy's in it. Rami Malek played David Hill. Josh Peck played uh, Kenneth Bain Bainbridge. I mean, you just had, uh, and this is one of the few movies I actually pulled up the cast list so I could be right. Josh Hartnett was in it. And just the way he was, uh, I don't want to say made up because that makes it sound like costume and stuff. Cause he really wasn't. It was just, I haven't seen him in so long. Like every time he was on screen, I'm like, who is that? Who is that? And I don't consider Josh Hartnett I mean, he's a good actor, but he's just not somebody that I would picture in a movie like this. So I think that's what threw me off as well. I considered this movie, and this is a good and a bad thing. This movie was a cornucopia of A and B listers of Hollywood all the way through. And the reason I say it's a good and bad thing, literally, we're sitting there and all of a sudden, oh, here's a new character. Oh my God, I recognize him. He's from so-and-so. She's from this. And it was like, like every 10 minutes, boom, another character, boom, recognize him. Oh my God, they're in a Senate scene. Recognize him and him and him and him and you're going through. So what that does though is because they're not just nobodies, it pulls me out for a brief minute because I'm like, oh my God, look at that. I said, Macon Blair, he's going to be the uh, uh, the counsel for Oppenheimer during this hearing yeah. and things like that. And then you, you sink back in, you know, then you find, you know, oh, my God, it's Kenneth Branagh. He's playing yeah. Niles. Oh, my God, I love him. And then you get back into the story. So I love the fact uh, that there were so many great actors in this and every actor was great in the role that they played. And you just expect when you see a big name actor, they're going to be on for a while. Sometimes they were on for 60, 120 seconds and that's it. Yeah. That's the thing. Sometimes, sometimes you really just got the feeling that, you know, whether Nolan uh, was the one that reached out to these people or these people are like, I want to be in a Nolan film and reached out and said, I don't care if it's for 30 seconds. One guy, I'm looking at the list, dude, Scott Grimes. He's from the Orville. Orville, yes, I saw he him. was in it. Council guys, yeah, and then Alden, uh, Enron Reich. I know I screwed it up, but he's Got the it. guy that played Solo. So anyhow, there was a, there was a very large cast, very very uh, great cast in the movie, and like Dennis said, it does. The basic movie is you come to realize is Robert Downey Jr.'s character, Louis Strauss is going for confirmation to be, um, Oh my God. What was the, what was the actual seat? Well, it's a cabinet position. It, yeah. He was going and, for a cabinet nobody, position. Nobody's ever been turned down for it. Right. And, and you learn as the movie goes on that he's basically set these wheels in motion against Oppenheimer so he would get this cabinet seat and you're just like, what is this dude's problem? And then obviously, so it's a twofold story. It's about how the bomb was created, but it's also about this relationship between, between Strauss and Oppenheimer. And, and, the, and the, the secondary story actually is bec- really the main story because right. it takes place today you know that's the current timeline in the in the 50s here where he's going for the confirmation hearing but in order to weave it you're going back into the past during world war ii where groves has to appoint oppenheimer and they decide you know you need to lead this but what's oppenheimer's background um you know they do such a good job of incorporating without showing the war so there this is not an action yeah. film 
This is a pseudo documentary. It's a docu pic. And um, it, it does such a great job of taking history and trying to stay very true to it. All of this while doing everything with practical special effects. The one thing that Nolan said was there is no CG at all in this. He sent his guys out in order to build bombs in order to make it. And it showed. I mean, we've gotten so used to CG and yes, more expensive. The practical effects were phenomenal in this. The story was was riveting. Three hours, you know, it felt maybe two and a half ish. Um, I, I couldn't get enough of it. And there are even certain parts like from the history of it, the whole point of the apple that you'll see it towards the beginning. I don't remember like when he in, injects the poison into it in real life. I don't think he went back and like slapped it out of the guy's hand. I think, you know, the teacher just never ate it. And cause that was something he had always regretted the whole point of when the bombs completed, you know, they, they didn't show the part where the plate never properly fit on. So there were a few things that I was expecting when they introduced it that didn't quite pan out. But, I mean, it was three hours. How much more can you fit into it? It, it was just, in my mind, a masterpiece. The score, the sound, everything fit together. The musical score, while I, it wouldn't be something I would go by and just listen to, it was perfect for every moment of this movie. Yeah. And, you know, so Dennis goes into it and he knows about Oppenheimer a lot, you know, whereas I went into it knowing, oh, yeah, he's the dude that created the bomb. That's really all I knew. So for me, it was very entertaining, but obviously very educational as well. I had no idea that him, well, his brother and his brother's wife, well, his brother basically got pulled in to to want to joining the American uh, Communist Party uh, by his wife, I guess, fiance at the time. And they were trying to get Oppenheimer in, which he never did join. But I thought it was interesting just go, you know, at Berkeley, going to basically these commie parties, you know, get togethers. And, you know, later in the movie, during like the hearing, uh, with against Oppenheimer, they were trying to use that against him. But one of the things that I thought was interesting is, you know, he was just he, Oppenheimer was just a curious guy. He just wanted to know about stuff, you know. And he went there not because he was wanted to join it. He went there just to learn about it, you know. And and I think, you know, in this day and age. It's it's almost the same. If you just want to learn about something, depending on who you are, they'll paint that as a target on you and go, oh, he's totally into this. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm just reading about it because I want to learn about it and try and get into the, the thought process that people that are into this stuff are, are using. So I thought that was really interesting. I didn't know that. Um, but like Dennis said, you know, the effects were fantastic. Every Everybody's role you know, the casting was great. Um, he did flip back and forth from black and white to color, um, in the movie as well, which were, which was cool. He, uh, cause you know, obviously there was an effect behind it. And once he started, once you got into it enough, when it would cut to like black and white, it wasn't jarring. You were like, Oh, okay, this is what we're focusing on. Um, uh, like Dennis said, they didn't show any war stuff, but they had some nice symbolism in it. Uh, w that showed like the inner struggle that Oppenheimer had with himself with creating this because, you know, he knew creating it was basically had to be done, but he wasn't thrilled with creating it because of, you know, once you uh, squeeze the toothpaste out of the tube, there's no putting it back. So you know, they, they you bring know. up Prometheus and, and it really was, I thought it was brilliant how they portrayed his inner struggle at first while he's trying to fit, you know, pig figure out, he lives in a different world, M yeah. much like uh, Albert Einstein, who's also in the movie. And it's great how you see the symbolism, how he's trying to figure it out. And then once he does, 
he's realizing it's Pandora's box. And once it's done, it'll never go back in. And, and what has he done? The other cool thing is it really delved into his personal life because Florence Pugh plays Jean, his girlfriend initially, somebody who you think he would wind up marrying. But we don't know at the time if she was bipolar, but she had a lot of issues on there. He actually loved her and that they actually portrayed so much of that. I was surprised. And then later on when he winds up marrying a kitty, you know, Emily Blunt, uh, the wife, and then their tumultuous relationship over the years. And they did such a good job of showing you all the different aspects of his life. And all of these different things all played a part in the final result. And yeah. I, I, I thought this was master crafted. Uh, Nolan movies are, are very hit or miss for me, like Tenet, not one of my favorite movies. Uh, Interstellar, I thought was really cool. Um, I, I, I've enjoyed them. This one is right up there. This is, you know, if you're a Dunkirk fan, for you're going to like his type of movies on that. I think you're going to fall in love with this movie. Um, all in all, I I have to see it a second time. I want to see it on IMAX because I know I missed so much because of all the actors. Okay, baby. CGC this movie. I'm giving this a 9.4. I love this movie. Not quite perfect, but it's it's starting to edge its way up there. This is one I will probably own in 4K. 4K, uh, I'm giving it a 9.2, so we are very close. Uh, like you said, this is, if you're into history, if you know, if you think you know everything about Oppenheimer, I'd still say go watch it just because what you learned is probably from reading uh, maybe some visuals, but this just puts a nice visual throughout the whole thing. Uh, Killian Murphy, I just thought was freaking fantastic. I told Dennis that I'm sure he's played, you know, uh, uh, leading type roles, normal people roles, as I like to call them before. But, you know, the roles I know him for, he's usually playing some, uh, just some oddball type character, which you, Scarecrow, you know, the guy from 28 days, things days like later, you know, it's, oh, it's oh, always that. some secondary character where he's, uh, uh, an antagonist almost but you felt he was oppenheimer in this from the oh yeah very His, you see him on the screen to the very moment that credits roll he there's no doubt he lived and breathed this role he was just yeah. utterly fantastic and it went through the ages so you know there was young middle age and old and they did the makeup team did a great job as well so anyhow uh i'm giving it a 9.2 uh do we have it just came out so do we have stuff from rotten tomatoes if we not? Do. um imdb is a 9.0 which is wow. really high for imdb and rotten tomatoes the critics are giving it a 93 um with the critics like it and the audience is giving it a 95. So look at that. This is a very well-received movie across the board. Beautiful. And what else is well-received is Core Draft the Reckoning. Guys, we're at $82,003 on Indiegogo. Now remember, we ran a mirror campaign on Kickstarter a few months back in the spring. So we're over 86000 creeping towards uh, the 90000 stretch goal that is the Necronite playable character card. You guys are going to want to get this because there is a game module that uh, Dennis wrote that you can also get on the campaign separate or as we like to say with the book, two totally different stories. And uh, it's a playable role-playing game. And you're already getting, every backer is already getting the Shattered Reach map, 7x10 print, the Adriana, the Lilaneth, and of course the big man himself, Core draft playable character card, seven by ten, image on the front, uh, uh, stats on the back. Uh, this is the Lilaneth one right here. Every backer's getting it. So, with your help, let's keep this going. 76 pages of ball busting, barbarian, bloodletting action as Core draft seeks vengeance for those who slaughtered his tribe. But the picture is much bigger than that. It's not just simple as one tribe warring against another. 
uh, go check it out. The t-shirts come down at the end of this month so we can get those to order. You can read the first eight pages here. If you haven't read them yet, you can click on this link and this will take you to read pages one through 11. These links are all in the description below. Uh, you're going to want to be a part of this campaign. I'm working on page 72 out of 76. Guys, we're almost at the finish line. I can see the red tape or the yellow tape, whatever color the tape is. I'm about to run through and go, the art for the book is done. So uh, there you go, guys. Check it out. Um, I don't know if we'll be, we're going to try and fit a movie in for next week. Thursday's rough because I'll be out of town. Uh, so maybe we'll catch a movie that has been out that we haven't seen yet. Like transformers I still haven't keep, seen it. We keep saying transformers. So maybe, maybe this week we'll hit it. Or maybe I'll sneak out to see sound of freedom over the weekend. Dennis has already seen it and we can review that. God, it's so good. Um, all right, guys, thank you for joining us uh, next week. Actually, I do want to tease our guest for next week. Give me one second. Uh, I do not want to mess up the creator's name because that would be rude and disrespectful. I mean, you know, Dennis comes over here and calls me Anthony and I'm just like, dude, we've known each other for how long? That is not my name. What's with the disrespect? He's like Anderson. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, oh, come on, Dennis. So, you know, that's what he does. Uh, so next week's guest is the uh, creator of uh, Amarok, which is a book that is crowdfunding right now on Indiegogo. It is Joshua Durstein. This guy, I cannot wait to talk to this guy. He's 18 years old. Uh, this is his first crowdfund campaign. He's got some top-notch talent uh, working on the book with him as inking and coloring. Uh, I was not doing this at 18. So that's our guest Wednesday, 5 p.m. Join us then, and we'll talk to you later. See you then. Bye-bye, Dan.